Welcome to the latest edition of the MVP cast from me, Mark Woods. Our guest this time is a former, I think we can call him a superstar of the domestic game who's become quite the mover and shaker within the basketball arena. He was a crack shot shooting guard for the great Crystal Palace team of the 1980s and England International as well. Then he went into the television industry running FIBA's media division for over 15 years before joining digital sports company DAZN last year. He is Paul Stimson and welcome to the MVP cast. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, I hope uh, you're staying safe. Uh, you too. Where do we find you uh, during this global lockdown? Uh, I'm, I'm at home. Uh, I live in France, just across the border from Geneva, where, where Fever are based. And so uh, we're in the lockdown. We're in uh, week eight of lockdown. So uh, it's um, they're, they're easing up things on Monday. They've, they've divided up. France into green and red zones and we're a green zone so it's a little easier but still it's been quite draconian compared to the UK but uh, they seem to be getting on top of things at the moment. At least you have wine always at close at hand. Yep yeah definitely uh, tonight is a wine night weekend <laughs> definitely for the wine. Every night is every night is weekend and every night is a wine night at the moment. Um, lots to talk about I mean let's let's start with the playing days um, Obviously, that Crystal Palace team, I remember growing up watching it on television. It was such a force within the domestic arena. You went into that, that, that group and you were in England International at the age of 19 when Vic Gambler was the coach. And coming through, though, into that league at such a young age and flourishing from such a young age, what was the biggest thing that cemented your development and, and essentially made you into a player who was ready to succeed relatively young? Um, that's a very good, that's a very good question, Mark. Um, I think, I think first of all, I mean, I was lucky enough to join the Crystal Palace setup as a, a, a as a junior. I started there when I was probably fourteen or so, and, and went through the the junior program, which really developed very sound basics. But also the fact that the Crystal Palace men's team were the top team, them and Embassy were the two top teams really in the league, and so we had many sort of. Um, heroes and, and stars to look up to and you know Jimmy Guyman was was there Mark Sayers Martin Hall Paul Philp Ken Wharton and and so you know when I came up and started to be involved a, around them and the very first coach was Tom Wisman who, who was coaching then uh, who then went out to Asia um, I really found myself as you know the really young kid but with all these uh great great players international players and, and very very good players and and right from the early right from the start the culture was you know you practice hard and you know nothing was uh, nothing was easy and you either you know you either sink or swim and, and get stuck in and I learned an awful lot from that and and because of the training and and education I'd had with Roy Packham and the, and the juniors that's that held me in good stead I mean very few players certainly compared to now I went to the US at that point you, know, you, you were getting you know very high level coaching you were getting you know good junior basketball then good senior basketball domestically and then of course in Europe as well how much do you think that was that was a system that almost demanded the improvement you know you know that there was you almost had to improve and to to excel to to survive at that point Yes, definitely. I mean, um, you know, people, when you look back and you say about the, the US, but at the time, you know, I was playing basketball training four, five nights a week with all these players. We were playing in Europe regularly. We were playing, you know, Maccabi Tel Aviv. You were playing Barcelona. You were playing Real Madrid. Uh, and so you had top teams you were playing against. And, um, and, and also I had my education and, and for me that was also very very important that I wanted to make sure I always had my education and, and my parents from that into me at an early age that was crucial so I think I was I was fortunate enough that I had exposure to top top level basketball or as highest level basketball as I could and you know I was I was playing and uh, and that that enabled me to develop within a home environment when you had that very unique cast of of great players, we had Alton Bird, who was a recent guest on, on, on this podcast, Jimmy Guy and Mickey Bet, as you said, I mean, how, how, was there a sense that you were feeding off those guys? Because practices must have been incredibly intense. Uh, definitely. I mean, um, 
when Orton joined us in uh, in in seventy in eighty when he first came over. Sorry, seventy nine when he first came over. I mean, he sort of changed the face of uh, of basketball as everyone knows. And for me, you know, at that time I was I was nineteen, uh, twenty, and uh, I was at Borough Road, and suddenly there was this point guard who was just magic, and uh, and he was a great teacher, and and the mentality was. We're here to play. We're here to win, and and practice was as intense as any games, and there was no letting up. And we had a lot of juniors as well. You know, there was there was you know, Mickey, as you said, Clive Hartley, Richard Rudd, um, and Roger Richardson. There were a whole bunch of juniors, and everyone wanted their time. Everyone wanted to impress. So it was it was full on in practice, and 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 you thrived on that. Uh, as I said earlier, you either sank or, or, or swam. I mean. I mean, it's a culture that still exists in a sense in, in mainland Europe and other, in other countries throughout the world you know, where you have the pyramid system and you know, you're coming through as a junior, you become part of a club, you see the senior players on a, a daily or nightly basis there, you learn from them as well. Do, do you think, I mean, that integration factor we don't really have in British basketball now, and it, you know, with a few very small examples, but... How big is that in a creating the aspiration factor for a young player such as yourself, but also that education that isn't really something that's taught directly. It's the learning by osmosis. Yeah, I mean, definitely. We were very fortunate. We, as you say, we had an all through club. And, and a lot of the other clubs did as well. Birmingham had a, had a good junior development uh, program as well. And, and you really felt part of the club. You saw your progression. Uh, you tried to emulate the, the the stars, and and you could all do it within one environment, which was which was great. I mean, you know, I never thought I would ever you know play anywhere else. For me, it was Crystal Palace and uh, and all the people, all the you know David. Terry Doherty, uh, or the you know Roy Packham, Harry Baker. Uh, yeah, everyone was part of it. We we had that. We had our Christmas tournament, the New Year's tournament, WICB, and so you were really part of a family. There were a whole group of volunteers uh, that I still see posting and uh, showing on Facebook and stuff, and 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 that you were really part of this huge family, and you didn't want to let anyone down. Can you remember what the first professional salary was that they gave you? Well, I remember the the very first. It was my first year at um, it was my first year at uh, Borough Road, and my first contract I had is I didn't get paid, but I got a car. <laughs> and uh, and and for me, of course, you know, you know, being at, at college, having a car was was fantastic. Um, but you know, for me, playing the basketball, it was never. It was, it was always a second income. It was never my major income. Uh, I always had uh, uh, another uh, salary, another another job, uh, but um, but yeah, the car was the very first thing. I remember that was my first contract. And what was the car? Um, it was uh, it was an uh, it was an Allegro, and then we got sponsored by a car company by Lada Cars. Oh, and nice quality. First, exactly when we first met Ed Percival who was uh, uh, involved at, at the time and we had larder cars and I remember it had the, no power steering in those days and the biggest it was like the steering wheel was huge it was like driving a bus so you definitely developed great forearms just steering the car but uh, it was a car it was for free and uh, and uh, when I was at college and uh, all, all my friends we you know we loved it for, for our younger listeners, Lada was a Russian, or sorry, I should even really say Soviet Union car that you were generally, if your friend's parents had one of them, you wanted, they wanted to be left off at some distance from school, not the coolest machine. But there you go. Anything that you can get at that age possibly is useful. Yeah, uh, Mark. When you yeah, when it's a sponsor and it's given to you, you drive it <laughs> as long as it worked. And I have to tell you, it did work all the time. It never let me down. <laughs> I mean. That that era of 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 British bus. When we, it's nice to look back through sort of rose tinted glasses, which 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 we can all do from time to time. But there was a sense that it was big, and in European terms, that you know, specifically the English league at that point, but the British game in in, in a sense when Livingston and Murray etc. came in. But there was a sense it was a big player within Europe. I mean, at, at the time, did it feel like that for you? And, and do you think looking back, it was as 
as big and significant as, as perhaps it, it appeared from the outside? Um, y yes, I mean, certainly, uh, I remember when when Peter Sprogis, uh joined the BBL. I remember the first year in 1977, 78, uh, as I started training with the uh, uh, with the Palace team. Uh, Peter had joined the team from Embassy, and that was a huge move because at the time Peter and, and Sprogis and Jimmy Guyman were the two, you know, superstars of the league. And but very quickly, within a month or two, he left to join the BBL uh, on the marketing side there. And then we had a situation where, you know, we 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 had uh, the, the Channel Four coverage that came. We had um, uh, we had sponsorship. We had Adidas that provided all our uniforms, all our shoes, and. And and certainly the league was was run well, and some clubs were strong, uh, and and had good good development, and a lot of clubs played in Europe. I mean, you know, everyone tried to play in Europe, and we played every year, um, and we used to get to the to the group stage of the European Cup, um, and then you'd come up against you know the, the big the big teams, and you know to this day that, that there are players like Mickey Berkovitz at Israel who who I who I, I meet now, and we still reminisce about the times when we played against each other all those years and years and years ago, and we were just the English team, Crystal Palace, you know, and no one really took us seriously, but we we tended to run teams close. Sometimes we would win the you know the odd game and surprise people, uh, and then after a while there were no surprises because everyone started to hear about the teams and you know prepared stronger against us. Do you think that was the point where? I don't want to say where British basketball went wrong because we could argue many points like that would be in the running. But do you think the fact when teams stopped being regularly in continental competition was the point when perhaps the level dropped a little bit, the visibility, the credibility perhaps fell down and that the league here and the teams here weren't quite perceived as, as major players anymore? Um, yes, I think... I think our league became insular. Um, uh, I remember uh, many, many years ago, they went, we, you know, we had the ruling of two foreign players and a dual national. Uh, and then the league kind of went away and it opened up to, to, to more uh, non-English players, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But I honestly believe that you always need to have a pathway for your for your development program, for your, your, your young players. British kids to, to, to play. And then when you're not playing in Europe, um, it, is a, it is a different game. It is, it is a different game and different experiences. And that holds you in good stead, of course, when you then play with your national team against these teams. So I think to have that European experience, if you possibly can, but it comes down to budgets, it comes down to, you know, planning. And as you say, there was a there was a period where everyone was playing, lots of teams were playing in Europe. And then we, we moved away and became maybe more insular as a British league and, and lost that link. How much of the culture was an was an impact or it was a factor at that point in time? Because yeah, as you said, you had another job on the side. You know, it wasn't as all professional sport is these days such a, a full on, I want to say professional manner, but you know, you know what I mean? It's, you know, you guys could go out and have fun. There was a the social aspect to it all, etc. I mean, how much, how much did that for you make it a joy to play the game as now where it's, it's very much, it's a business and a profession, if I can put it that way. Um, the, at, at the time, it was funny because I was talking uh, to, to, to someone uh, about this a few weeks ago is growing up it was very much a case of you studied and you played basketball so all that practice would be at, in, at night so you would you know you, you would work or study during the day and then you'd go off and, and practice at 8 till 10 or 8 30 10 30 or 7 till 9 and then afterwards all the guys used to go for a drink um, and um, the full-time players and then were maybe three or four or five full-time players they might work out during the day and lift weights uh, or, or do other aspects but we would then have a practice together and you'd practice four or five nights a week but during the day everyone was away you know doing their you know their, their normal jobs 15 major trophies you've picked up what stands out from that massive haul 
Um, what stands out? I mean, the first one. I remember the first uh, the first one where I was really involved uh, with with Alton and uh, uh, and Mark Sayers. We won the the Butlins Cup uh, um, up in Sheffield uh, against Doncaster uh, and Ian Day. Uh, Cliff Bell and the, the team there, and I remember that was the first trophy that we won in the, in that era. Uh, that obviously was always special. Winning at Wembley is, is always great. I mean, one of the things I personally hate—not openly hate losing, but I, I don't I don't like losing. So I'm I'm brought up well enough to say congratulations, but then when I go away, <laughs> I don't like it. So I don't remember the ones that we lose Uh, I only remember the ones that we won but probably the the, the ones that were really special I mean the the, the the last one where as Crystal Palace when we had merged with Brunel uh, in 1987 I think it was uh, Crystal Palace were on the verge we had financial problems and we merged John Kirkland at uh, at Brunel and David Lastly merged the two teams and, and Steve Ball well, Mickey Bat and myself went to, to Brunel and we joined up with Brian Kelly, Ron Dale Roberts, Julio Politi, Phil Ralph, uh, Cedric Frederick. And we came together as this team and sort of grew together during the season and then got to the playoffs. We beat Leicester over three games. I had Barry Young and Clyde Vaughan. Uh, Steve, uh, Steve O'Shea they had a great team. That was the old Loughborough team. Um, and then uh, we got to the finals and we played Portsmouth in the semi-final in Kingston with Steve Montrager and Dan Davis and everyone in the, in the final and fortunate enough to, to come through and, and, and win with kind of a six-man rotation or seven-man rotation. And that was very, very special, uh, I have to say, because we really were under underdogs and backs against the wall. But it was uh, it was a great camaraderie. And, and I've always played for nearly every team. There's always been a really good camaraderie by the team, either through the coach or through the players, natural osmosis I mean from going to all these big European venues and many of those teams who still are big names in Europe today but where was the most intimidating place or places to go to um, we played uh, we played uh, Panathinaikos in Greece and it was before they had their huge stadium now and we actually played under the Panathinaikos football ground they had behind under one of the stands was the basketball court so it was literally steel seats uh, concrete seats around the roof was at an angle and I remember we played there um, and it was a tight tight affair and the crowd are right there. It wasn't a particularly big crowd. Maybe it was three, 4,000 people, but they are right there. Um, Turkey was always a very, very intimidating, intimidating place to play. Um, and the uh, uh, Yad Eliyahu Stadium in Tel Aviv, uh, when we played Maccabi, was always intimidating as well because it's a lot bigger stadium. But it was Maccabi Tel Aviv, and in those days, you know, it was it was a tough place to go. I mean, internationally, we mentioned at the start about playing for England. I mean, you were the first player, the male player, to reach 100 caps. And But there was just that one European Championship Finals, which was in Prague back in 81, and you had that big win, the only win against Greece. You know, you score a game-high 22 points. But I wonder if, some bit, if that was maybe a source of perhaps frustration, you know, that there wasn't bigger international opportunities for you guys, because you know, it, it felt like you know there was a it was a generation of players there who were getting European experience, and we talk about that now for a lot of young British players playing overseas, playing in you know, European competition is such a such a big factor in development. But you only had that one finals. I mean, how did that feel like there was opportunities along the way that was maybe lost for for the England team? Um, yes, definitely. I mean, I remember in eighty one. You know, we hosted the pre-qualifying tournament in Jersey, and it was the year where where um, uh, Dan Lloyd had joined Pete Jeremich. Um, there was uh, Carl Tatum had come, Paul Richards. So we had a mix of of uh, of English players that had been educated abroad, but then we also had uh, Steve Asinda, Neville Hopkins, myself, Ian Day, who were you know 
kids that have been always in England. And we gelled and we won and we went to Turkey and we won there. And as you say, we, we went to Prague. Uh, we got to the top 12 to the finals, which was unheard of. And you just felt that at that point in 1981, we did beat Greece. Uh, and then Greek basketball went one way in 1987. They won the Eurobasket. And, you know, it is what it is now. And, yeah, maybe we lost lost the chance. Maybe, I don't know if it was funding, if it was vision. Um, after Vic, um, we had um, Tom Wisman for a coach for, for one year. Then Bill took over. Uh, we won the Commonwealth uh, tournament in, in New Zealand. And there were just two or three years where we were really competitive and you felt like we had some a good nucleus and we had good young players coming through. Dave Gardner, Scants were coming through, yeah. Sam Stiller. Uh, we had some real talent. There was Steve Bucknell, of course, Martin Clark. And um, and and just we, we lost our way and, and maybe we didn't have the preparation because at the end of the day, when it comes to the national team, it's all about preparation. You have to be together. You have to prepare. You have to be together as a team because when you're out in that court, you've got to rely on the five guys on the court and, and, and seven guys on the bench and, and, and the coaching staff. So you need that togetherness. I mean, you had those spells towards the end. You're playing career at Kingston and so on. And then you retire at the age of 30, relatively young in basketball terms to to head into the, the sports media business. I mean, how, as great as an opportunity as that was, how tough was that decision to hang up your boots so young? Um, in some ways, in some ways you'd like to have said, yeah, it would have been nice to, to, to carry on. But, you know, I had a situation, you know, I was at the, at the time I was playing at, um, uh, at, at, at Kingston, I was also uh, working for uh, Zodiac Toys, which was owned by Russell King and Alan Kingston, who were also involved as directors of the of the Kingston Club, and um, and I remember that in in this in January of 1990, there's. The Act toy chain went bust. So we had 91 toy chains. It was the biggest toy chain in the country. It went bust, and suddenly it was like, oh, what am I going to do now? Because although I was playing basketball, uh, it was I was always working, and so I was thinking. And an opportunity came uh, through uh, contact with Converse, who I, I knew the, the the MD of Converse Europe, because I'd been running the Basketball Monthly magazine at the time. It was also published by by. Um, by the same uh, group and um, he said to me he said oh you know uh, we've just signed as a sponsor of FIBA and FIBA are working with a sports marketing company called ISL uh, they're based in Switzerland and they're looking for a basketball manager and um, and it so happened that the person that was heading up and was vice president of ISL and in charge of athletics and of basketball was Peter Sprogis mm -hmm. And so um, I went there. I was fortunate enough to, to interview. I got the job and literally moved the family right after, pretty much after playing my last game in April uh, in Birmingham, which, which we won, which was lovely. I then moved in, in July, the family, and we moved to Lucerne in Switzerland. And I started uh, working in, in sports marketing. I mean, you... You went from that ISO on to FIBA Media, and you you're running that for you know, best part of two decades, and that's selling the TV and radio rights for the, the global game, FIBA's European competitions, etc. I mean that that's kind of passed through the multi-channel area, but era. But what's the, what's the pitch been for you in terms of selling basketball, and, and maybe how is how has that changed in an era where you know the NBA is such a strong product? You know they they sell their their shows they sell their games you know worldwide every, every country has it but what's the distinctive pitch for for the international and, and i suppose the european game alongside that well i mean with with fiba is when when we started and it was really quite strange because when i first worked for isl and the fiba account you know fever or well, fever you know as a classic player i got my fever license every year so i could play in europe and they made the rules, you know, I, I'm just like any other player, you know, that's what FIBA do. And so it was then only after that, that I, I started to, to realize that the governing body. And when I first worked with him in 1990 with Mr. Stankovic, they were, they were they had eight, nine people. And that was it running the governing body of the sport they were based in, in Munich. And there were nine people, 
um, and and then they and over the from 1990 to, to now, 30 years later, you know, they've grown into this huge organization. But the biggest single thing at the time was, you know, FIBA was about international basketball, although also at the time it also ran the European Club Championships and the Final Four, which is now the EuroLeague, up until uh, 1999. Um, it was um, it was run by run by FIBA. So we had that competition, and then we had the national team competitions. And the Eurobasket at that time was was eight teams. You know, there were qualifiers which weren't centralised in any way. And then in 1991, I remember in Rome, uh, when Yugoslavia uh, won. Uh, it was just a, with the start of the Prairie Cup for Yugoslavia. There were eight teams that played in the final round in the Palio in, the, in Rome. So it was national team basketball. Um, and then as it's as it's evolved and, and fevers got stronger, um, the NBA, who we actually work closely with, has never been a rival. In all the years I've sold basketball or distributed basketball rights around the world, never has one broadcaster said, oh, we won't take international basketball because we have the NBA, because it's actually complementary, because the best players play in the NBA. And then after that, they play for their national teams, which is obviously perfect for the, for the country. And it's also perfect, of course, for the NBA because it builds their their international exposure and presence. What when when you're putting this together to give people a flavour of of the back end of all this, what is that ingredient of a of a good basketball broadcast when you're sitting back from on high that you want to put together that the, you think then the public will tune in and watch and enjoy this? Um, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I probably can relate probably to last year's uh, Basketball World Cup in China because it's the most recent. Um, that was the biggest, most comprehensive basketball production that's ever been done for basketball. That more than NBA, NCAA, EuroLeague, uh, Fever in the past. I mean, we had eight venues, but we we decided to, to really showcase the sport. And and what you have to realize with production now, you have your live production, but your live production can be done with maybe four or five, six cameras. But what you then need after for digital content, for replays, stuff, that's where the other multiple cameras are used for slow motion. And we had, you know, we had eight venues, we had eight uh, teams that we, we had, we appointed ourselves. We had a rail cam at every venue that ran up and down the court, which has never been done before. Um, we had the referees mic'd live. So actually we had, you know, we could turn on the referee's mic when they were talking to a coach or a player so the fans could actually see and hear what was being said, which at one point people were very nervous about, but it was a, a great enhancement. And um, and so the production levels that you developed, but what you've really got to, to do nowadays is the world of, of sport or entertainment, because that's what the business we're in the live is one thing but it's also telling the story it's leading up to the game it's the stories it's watching the teams arrive it's seeing them warm up it's the actual game and then afterwards it's it's things after the game leading up to the next game so you try and make the tale and the story as long as you can and and develop enough content and stories to fulfill that and you can't do that with four cameras and playing a game every two weeks hard, hard tough a sell is that sometimes to the teams and the players involved you know to i guess to convince when we look at the current issue with the premier league that you know there's talks about when it reopens you, to compensate the broadcast in some sense that cameras might be allowed inside the changing rooms and there will be a bit more of a holistic approach to, to showcasing that narrative but you know how hard is that sometimes to persuade those behind the scenes who will have the secret rooms or you know that were there thrust open to to say this can actually help promote what you do to a bigger audience uh that is an excellent question mark and it is one that happens all the time i mean you know as a broadcaster or as a fan you want to see more and more and more 
And there are limits because as a coach and a team, going back to when we were a team, there are elements where you might need to be, you want to be alone and the coach needs to shout and curse and, 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 and you know, beat up on his team and he doesn't want that necessary to be publicized. So it's a fine line. Um, I mean, the NBA do it very well, but the NBA don't do anything live. So when you see the timeouts of the NBA, you see the, re the recording of a timeout in the first quarter in the third quarter after they've checked that everything is right and there's nothing bad. Likewise, in the locker rooms, you never see anything live afterwards. Uh, what we did again at the, at the World Cup, because it is most recent and we'd really wanted to think about it, we said to all the coaches that we will bring a camera to the locker room, to the winning team right after the game. But all we want is the team coming in, showing the excitement and enthusiasm, 30 seconds or a minute, and then we get out. We don't want to see anything more than that. And likewise, we'd like to see the final huddle of the team before they leave the, the locker room. And for the most part, uh, early on in the championship, coaches are very nervous, as you can imagine. But we got into the routine and they realized that what we said we wanted to do, we did. So no one was trying to cheat. And, uh, and, and it worked really well. And I think the pictures that came out, you saw, you know, teams winning. We only went to the winning room. We didn't want to go into the losing team's room because obviously that's really sensitive then. And it worked for it very well. And there are things that are happening more and more. And it's what people want to see. I've always thought it would be great to have a fisheye camera in a locker room so you can see all the players coming in and you can cut to it but maybe not the sound uh, but it's step by step process because there's always that fine line between what coaches and players and they do need a place where they can be isolated but at the same time the demand of the world now and the changing of entertainment is everyone wants to know more and more well I mean have you like the rest of us been watching The Last Dance uh, I have to say The Last Dance is, is, is excellent. I mean, it's uh, ESPN, the productions they've made, whether it's been the 30 for 30 series you know, that they started it all, it's been fantastic. And, of course, ESPN pushed it forward, the release date, because of the lockdown and because of the lack of live sport. And it is, it's compelling. And it's compelling. I've had people contact me who aren't into basketball necessarily just because it is Michael Jordan and it's the Bulls and the way it's been documented there's some you know it's warts and alls there's some issues there that people have got opinions on and uh i think it's it's a great production do you think that will i mean nfl films have, have really sent the benchmark i think on this for for years and years and years but do you think it will and you'll see you're dealing with a lot of sports in your in your current job but you think it will make some sports some teams some leagues you know we've seen some of the amazon series with man city etc but do you think it will make more teams and players set up and go actually this could create content maybe not live but down the stretch that we should record preserve and in the future have brilliant television out of it yes i mean the thing is it, it doesn't happen just by chance so someone has to have a budget at the beginning of the year to say okay i have this film crew and we are going to follow you 365 days this next year now if the bulls hadn't uh, and i think i don't want to give it away in the last dance but i think they're going to win their third uh, championship i mean yeah that's uh, there's a spoiler for spoiler you. alert but, everyone <laughs> but you can imagine that if the bulls hadn't have won what's the story then and so it, it's you know, it, the budget you put and you say, okay, you'd still have some content that you could use, but you couldn't have the last dance necessarily. And so it's a risk. And, you know, you've got to have a budget and say, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to follow this team. But I think it is something now to have develop an archive. It's, it shouldn't drive your sport and drive your team, but it can provide so much content that can enhance everything around your team and that's what what is going to improve the popularity of your club of your sport and and players will buy into that uh, i'm sure because at the end of the day if their club gets more popular they're the showcase i mean they're the actors they're the ones that will gain the most out of it british basketball or british television and basketball you've many times 
been selling international basketball and into British TV and you had that great BBL run in Channel 4, the stretch when Sky Sports had BBL and NBA. But a lot of the time, you know, basketball's been a hard sell. The domestic game's been a, a nomadic, I guess, partner for, for with a lot of broadcasters. Why is it so tough to get hoops on British television? Um, I, think, I think going back to the 80s and early 90s, there was a a culture and identity to British basketball. Uh, looking back when the BBL made their decision to take the, I don't know if it was a million pounds at the time, whatever, to go with NTL, uh, which was going to be the, the cable channel that was starting up and going to have their own sports where they'd been on Sky for so long and, and had a really good positioning on Sky. Um, the way they did that the fact that they went there and just basically told Sky we're off and then it didn't work out and they had their payout. But then, of course, the world has moved on and, you know, they didn't have Sky any longer and Sky obviously were were, were miffed at the, the way it was handled, which wasn't, wasn't the best way. And then you're fighting against it. The other thing is to build a sport in a country, you need heroes. And I firmly believe you need homegrown heroes that you can relate to. You can have international players that, that come in, but ultimately they're not necessarily going to just come in and stay. And at the end of the day, particularly with the British mentality and psyche, you need homegrown players. You need people that you can build on and that you can hold up. And it's not just playing basketball. It's and being on game shows and kids shows and being in the newspaper and 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 just creating an identity around your, your sport that then your sport goes from the back pages to the front pages or to the social pages and you know with social media in some many ways it's easier now but it's harder because there is so much out there but it takes a real strategy and a real plan and you've got to identify and you've got to build on those great players and let's say they can be international players as well but a mixture of the two and then and then i think if you build on that over time you you can have a successful product i think some of that you know if you and i spend a lot of time on other international setups and you know you see in france and and spain that the federations there are very much involved in promoting even their nba based players they're they're seen as part of that system they are seen as part of the product and the brand of, of that. And I think even when we had a stretch of having a lot of NBA players, which sadly we don't have now, was it not an opportunity missed there? And it, this goes back, I suppose, around the Olympics when a lot of those players were in, when they're prime, that you know, we didn't really push them out. They weren't accessible enough. I think the players have to take some responsibility possibly there as well, but there wasn't a real capitalizing on having genuinely top class players coming out of this country um yes uh looking back um and it's very easy obviously to look back in hindsight but that g you know the olympics in 2012 the team that, that we had uh everything around it the, the the financing of it there were so many opportunities that that we could have had both on the legacy on the coaching side, developing British coaches, developing you know, a pathway, and also, as you say, getting uh, an image of, of the team. I mean, you know, we have some very charismatic people. I mean, we were talking earlier and uh, recently I've just seen the documentary about Pops. Brilliant. I mean, what a, what a great documentary. And there's someone that has left us and is now running a G League team. He's a charismatic player, Luel Deng. You know, he came over, he gave it his all. He's now retired. He's president of the South Sudan Basketball Federation, but he still has his heart in in in, in the UK. And and so there are there are people. There's you know there's uh, Dan Clark. Um, and we have right now probably one the hottest basketball player in the UK is Ovi Sokol. Uh, you know because of what he did outside of basketball, but then. There should be a way to utilize that, to build on that. But it, it takes a planning strategy and, and and the players, as you say, have to buy into it. 
you know, they have to maybe, you know, trust or be realize they're part of something bigger and they're part of a family and they care. I mean, you mentioned Pops and you know, the comments that he made is a fascinating Instagram live series with, with Lowell. And, you know, part of the comments were talked about the lack of engagement with former players. And, yeah, I've, I've written about it. We've spoken, I'm sure, about it as well. That, you know, former players have huge roles to play in other countries. You know, you see in France, Boris Dio, Tony Parker have defined roles either ambassadors, but they're totally engaged even if they're not living in the country. We've had a generation that haven't been retained in the game in any way. You were slightly more fortunate. I know maybe the perception is different than reality, but your generation saw its predecessors much more and they were involved in the game. And how, how vital is having role models that you can see who people who have been there, who have done it, who have got the international t-shirt and then give that aspiration value? I, I think it's I think it's very important. I mean, it's not it's not a one size fits all. You can't just automatically say, "Oh, okay, this person is going to be be great." But you know, in my in my generation, you know, pops pops Luel Deng mentions Jimmy Rogers. What a you know wonderful person. Uh, pops mentions Joe White, another great person. You know, um, and and Humph Long. I mean, you know, just those three within within the london area and, and everything they've done and every region every city has people that are putting back and have put back and and and, and coaches and and development and and likewise you know we have players and it's not automatically to say a great player is going to be an administrator because maybe maybe that doesn't work just like great players aren't always great coaches but there must be a way of putting together a group and identifying what do I need or what does our sport need and who can help us. And and I really believe that. I mean, you know, in my generation, there are still people that still care passionately about basketball. I mean, Mark Clark is involved in development. Mickey Bett lives in Canada now, but follows it all the time and is still passionate about it. Alton talks about it, as you, you know, from your podcast, you know, the other week, uh, there's so many people. Kenny Nottage, who was involved, still has an involvement in, in Newcastle. And he's gone off and run the, you know, different things as well. And there's just so many people that we could tap into and and overall use those those players now or the players that have just retired because they are still in the, the mind's eye and they're charismatic players and they're people that I think, you know, the glass is half full and I think there are shoots and promising things we just need to bring it together when you look at the bbl from a distance but where do you see is there something there i mean you know there are those who would say tear it down rebuild it from scratch it has no value those who say it's made a lot of progress it's on the up albeit slowly when you look at it from afar is there a product there that has a potential value now to to grow and, and expand and maybe not reach the the size that it was before in terms of television visibility but is there is is there a nugget of something to build on um yes i i think so i mean i can only talk from as you say seeing abroad here i am in geneva france uh, I follow British basketball from a distance, so I don't know all the ins and outs, but I do know what I read that, you know, Leicester have their new arena, which is fantastic. Newcastle have their new arena, which is great. Uh, the London Lions have just got new investors. Glasgow are doing a great job. There's new investors in, in Plymouth. Worcester have a good program. And, and so, uh, and that, there's just a few. I mean, there, there are others. So I think that there are shoots and there are showing and anyone that has been in the sport for so long and kept in the sport to keep the, the clubs alive, whether it's, you know, Kevin Routledge or whether it's uh, Paul Blake or it's, uh, it's Vince or whatever. I think they're to be commended for that. And that, but I think there are shoots, but I think it's got to be looking on the outside. I think it has to be part of a joined up, strategy personally i mean when you look as you say in other countries it's it's joined up the leagues might run separately to the federation but it's joined up and at the end of the day it's how do we build basketball and the basketball that you will see every week 
in, in the UK is the BBL. And so how do we build that? But then how do we build that? And how do we build a national team and a junior teams? And how do we have it all joined up? So it, it's it's one. You've moved to the zone out of the FIBA sphere after after so long. Oh, yeah. I, I, and for those who don't know, DAZN is a we're out of the Perform Group. It's it's uh, streaming online digital content that is growing a lot of different markets. Not as much in the UK yet, I expect, but US, Germany, elsewhere. When you look at the market at the moment, and you you have in, in the basketball sphere, you know what we call OTT, over the top, so things you can get on your computer screen through apps, etc. And you have brilliant products like NBA League Pass, which are probably setting the standard for, for a lot of sports. How do you see that different delivery mechanism now providing opportunities or perhaps threats to, to those sports and those leagues like the BBL, WBBL, that haven't been able to break into that traditional primetime broadcast market? I think, I think OTT and, and as you say, such as the zone with the lockdown right now, one thing that is happening, people have suddenly realized about Netflix, if they didn't already know, Disney Plus, Amazon Prime, uh, and, and the OTT platforms, which is great because then the barrier to use it, they see that it works, they go on and they can view things when they want to view it. And so I think for the future, whether it's the zone or ESPN plus or 11 sports or whatever, and other OTT platforms, I think that's a positive, but I don't see it's one or the other. I think you have to have a joined up strategy and you have to work out how do you build the image and the proposal that you have for your sport and with your league, with your national team, whatever. And, you know, everyone says, I want, you know, free to air. It's got to be on the BBC. It's got to be on ITV. It's got to be on channel four or whatever, but you know, they only have one channel or two channels and, you know, they don't always are interested because whenever the BBC shows something or ITV, if no one watches it, it's not of value. And nowadays you don't have a, a charter where you've got to show, small sports or smaller community or ethnic things it's all about ratings and if people view then then that's great so you've got to find a way of joining the whole thing together and ott is part of that uh digital uh the digital channels social media channels and free to air and and there has to be a way of of joining that but it takes uh, a strategy it takes people sitting down and then the other thing is from the other side it takes we need to create a product. I mean, I remember when we first started with Channel 4, we played on a carpet. And, you know, before the game, they used to hoover it to, to clean it. And if we were like, as players, why are we playing on a carpet? Well, it was very simple because we were playing in sports, multi-purpose sports arenas that had their normal floors which look like the London Underground because you've got <laughs> volleyball marks, you've got badminton courts, you've got netball courts, basketball courts, you just had everything on it. And so you said, okay, when it comes to TV, how's that going to look on TV? Disaster. So they came up with the idea of they had this carpet that they bought and invested in, and whenever they played, they laid it down. Was it perfect? No. On TV, it looked fantastic. And every time you went out, you had this same approach. Then the other thing is, you say now, okay, if we produce something, it has to be produced in a certain way, and we have to make sure that it's engaging to fans. So, you know, how do we produce it, and what do we do? And you know, and having two cameras or three cameras at a game is might be cheap, but it might not be the answer because if it doesn't attract people to watch your product, then it's wasted money. But at the same time, you know, do you do every game? Well, maybe you don't do every game. Maybe you do one game, top notch, and maybe other games you take clips of and you make it into a show uh, which you can add into your live so you do your live game one day and the other games another day so you do a roundup uh, I don't know I'm just uh, just saying but it needs to be part of a whole joined up strategy and and then you have to go to a broadcaster whether it's OTT or whether it's cable or, or free to or whatever and put together a, a proposal to them as to how this works for them 
how are you going to partner with them and how can it develop? And I think if the BBL and the GB teams all came together and you had a package where you said throughout the year, we can show you basketball. Is it every week? Is it every other week? Is it whatever? Is it a, a, a magazine show? I mean, the NBA grew up in most of the world, not through their live coverage. The NBA first grew up through inside stuff and their 30 minute highlight program where everyone thought that every time a player got the ball, they'd, they'd dunk or, or score. When you saw a first game, NBA game for the first time ever, it's like, boy, it's so long. <laughs> There's so many, and they miss shots. It's so many dead periods, but you know, that's how they started their product, you know, 30, 40 years ago and, and they built it up from there. So I think, you know, you, you've just got to really think, what is our strategy? How do we want to go forward? And, and there are multiple points across the board as to, as to how, how you need to do that and who is best to do that. Let's finish off and talk about FIBA, one thing. I mean, now, now you've, you've left, but you're still engaged. But how do you see FIBA evolving over the next five, ten years under Andreas Salkas, who you know, seems to have come with a different approach, a more open mind. I mean, where do you think it will or perhaps should evolve and grow as an organisation? Um, yeah, you're asking some good questions here, here, Mark. Uh, yes, I mean, you know, with the passing of, of, of Patrick Bowman, very, very sadly, um, uh, a year about two years ago now, well, a year, 18 months ago, and with Andreas. Andreas was starting to be mentored to be the next Secretary General because Patrick Bowman was being touted to be the next IOC president. So, uh, you know, in, in those terms, and, and Andreas has come on, and he certainly, there is a very good senior management structure within FIBA. Um, what has happened, unlike any other federation, is there is one FIBA, FIBA, there is one worldwide budget for basketball. So in football, for example, you have FIFA, UEFA, you have Commonwealth, you have uh, Asian Football Federa uh, Confederation. Here within basketball, FIBA, there is one governing body and each of the regions in Europe, Africa, Asia, and um, Oceania and the Americas, the one budget all comes from FIBA. So everyone is an employee of FIBA so that the, the ability to be able to drive the sport forward. And and what FIBA is trying to do first is, uh, on the development side, is obviously to build in countries where basketball uh, needs to be more popular, so it's investing in grassroots development. Um, the the uh, qualifying system now, which you know people think, oh, well, there's not so many Eurobaskets, there's one every four years, but the national team playing regularly at home is is a driver and is an engine to drive your sport. It has to be because, you know, the GB team playing six games in a year, as opposed to not playing at all, has to be a, a driver and promote your sport. Um, I think with club basketball, there needs to be a way of bringing a hierarchy of club basketball. So hopefully there's, there's ways to, um, to bring a hierarchy together with, European club basketball with, with the EuroLeague and, 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 and Basketball Champions League and other competitions as there are in the Americas and, and Africa. Um, in Africa, there's a, now a league, the Basketball Africa League, which is a JV with the NBA, which is fantastic. In Asia, there's a league you know, trying to develop something. So I think that is something that is important, but also just to showcase that whenever international basketball is played, it reaches it's engaging, can reach as many people in an engaging way as uh, as possible. And, you know, we have uh, 80 countries playing the World Cup qualifiers, 96 countries playing the Continental Championship qualifiers. It's a huge operation, but if we can develop the production, the teams playing regularly and, and engage the media to talk about it and fans to talk about it, whether it's through newspapers, digital or whatever, then that's going to build, that's going to build uh, uh, an interest. But then it comes back, as the, what we came back to uh, talking about, it comes back to the federations in the countries and the leagues. Because if the leagues can, can build on that as well, and the federations can build on it, then the overall sport will, will develop. Let's hope so. Um, Paul, thanks for your time. I think it's been a thrilling ride through 
domestic basketball and matters international but uh, stay safe enjoy your wine i'm sure you've got some great stuff on top and uh, keep doing good work Mark, thank you very much. I will have a glass or two of red tonight. And uh, thank you for all your work. And, uh, you know, let's keep pushing basketball and see where we can uh, get to. But in the meantime, please, everyone, stay safe and uh, stay healthy. Stay sane. Yes, that's the most important thing. Thanks, Paul. That's it for this edition of the MVP Cast. You can get all our previous editions via our website at mvp247.com or your preferred podcast provider. Some great new editions coming up over the next few weeks. But for now, for me, Mark Woods, stay safe. We'll catch you soon.